Uh, this session is really a, a continuation of what we began in our last session, last evening. We were talking about majesty, glory, and honor. And along that theme, I want to continue. We didn't even finish our outline in our last session, but I specifically want to talk to you about being prepared and equipped, something God has done for us, but that we have to respond to. And I, I don't have time to recapitulate everything we said, but I, I do want to set the, the big idea in place that the greatest honor of our lives is serving the Lord. Everything else that comes to us is secondary to that. Any achievement, any accomplishment, any resource that we're entrusted with, any honor that is bestowed upon us, any recognition we gain, everything pales in comparison to the great honor and privilege of serving our Lord. We have done our faith a disservice to imagine that it's about attending church or joining a church or participating in a denomination or getting our theology correctly aligned. All of those things have a place, and I'm grateful for them. I've spent my life in the church. But serving the Lord is the greatest honor of our lives. There's nothing that will ever be extended to you as a human being that will compare with the privilege of participating in the eternal kingdom of our God. And if that reality hasn't yet broken into your heart, it may live in your head, but it hasn't broken into your heart yet, begin to say to the Lord, Lord, help me to understand. Let the magnitude of that, the majesty of that, the wonder of that, the glory of that break into my heart. It'll change your life. It will transform serving the Lord from something that's odious and burdensome and intrusive to a great honor and a great privilege. I'll take that as an amen, resounding across the building. And then we spent a, a, a bit of the session talking about our journey through time. You know, the Bible says that God knows you when you're knit together in your mother's womb. And then he breathes his spirit into us. And then comes that momentous day when you break forth into the light of day. And that begins a journey, and we make a journey through time. And we can track it through our physical and emotional and maturing. But in the context of eternity, and your spirit is eternal, when your physical body fails, you're not done. Your spirit will step right into eternity. And it's our journey through time, that little brief journey we have on planet Earth under the sun that determines the outcome of our eternity. So it's a very significant thing. There are no wasted days. It's not something brief. It's just right. The designer, the creator of all things, designed you for a purpose on planet Earth and for your journey through time. So we looked at some biblical insights for that journey and then some personal information from the designer to help us do it more effectively. God's told us so much about what this journey is about. And if we'll just pay attention, we can be prepared. If you didn't get to hear the, the previous session, I, it, you can find it. It's on the website or YouTube or someplace out. It's in the cloud. <laughs> Maybe if you stand outside, you can just hear it. I don't know how all that works. <laughs> but I want to continue that theme this morning. It's, it's really information for our journey through time. And the next step in that is recognizing this notion about prophetic information, and it comes from a sovereign God. Biblical prophecy is not principally foretelling. It's not so much about telling the future. A biblical perspective on prophecy is giving you God's perspective on what's happening now, God's perspective on your life and our world. Now that will bring with it some future components, but it's principally, what would God say to us today? If you read Jeremiah and Isaiah and those prophets that you know, when you read when Jesus' prophetic passages, principally he's talking about the world in which he's living. So when we talk about prophetic information, we need to understand it comes from a sovereign God. The sovereignty of God means God can do what he wants, when he wants, the way he wants, and he needs no one's approval. He is sovereign. Now, if there is a sovereign creator and designer over all, which is what the Bible tells us, I would submit to you it would be in our best interest to understand his perspective. And this isn't complicated. This isn't beyond us. In Deuteronomy 30 in verse 19, God is speaking to the, the Hebrew people. He said, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. God has given us a choice. He's created us with the freedom to choose. You can choose to serve the Lord 
with your whole heart, mind, soul, and body. Or you can choose to serve yourself. God's given you that freedom and that privilege to every one of us. It's not about our circumstances. It's not the circumstances of our birth or the nature of our life or whether our parents were good or bad or the schools we attended were great or mediocre. God's given us a choice to choose him. He's the difference maker. And, and we have a long history that the Bible is the story of that. It's not new. That's presented in Deuteronomy. It's the books of Moses. And God's counsel is pretty straightforward. You wouldn't think we would need a, a prompt from the Creator, but He said, hey, I set before you life and death. Choose life. But we still struggle with that. Because in this context, life is defined for us. It says that you can love the Lord your God, listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him. If you don't intend to do that, you're choosing death. Now, what's on the opposite side of the equation? That powerful force within every one of us, that carnal, selfish part of us that says, I want, and I feel, and I think. Therefore, I won't listen, and I won't serve. Well, I might when it's convenient or comfortable, but that's not the, the essence of being a Christ follower. So for the, for the first component of this notion of a, a prophetic perspective is saying, God, I choose you. I choose you in my home. I choose you in how I do business. I choose you in how I recreate. This is not complex. It's not conceptually beyond us. It's just not easy. We would prefer to renegotiate that and say, what if I go to church and I pick one of those crazy churches, maybe service last two hours. <sighs> this is not one of those. You're safe. But I mean, suppose. Some of you were looking at your watch like, what did I get into? I'm like, <laughs> and, and, and I'll attend three weeks out of five. I mean, I need one for rain and I need one for something. And then the rest of it's mine. Biblically, that's called deception. We're not Christians because we sit in this building. We serve the Lord 24-7. And we don't serve him at all. Now we don't do it perfectly. We step in holes. We're inconsistent. We're in process. That's not an excuse for sloppiness. But we need to understand the dynamic. There's so many choices. And the biblical counsel is choose the Lord. It will put you in the minority. Get prepared for that. And then and the second component of the, this prophetic notion, and the reason it's worth giving God your attention, is God knows the ending at the beginning. That's like the ultimate open book test. God knows how it's going to finish. And if he'll listen to you, he'll help you. That's why he says, choose life. This is really the better path. Who said? The creator. Well, I don't believe in him. Your choice. I do. Doesn't mean there's not debates within me. Doesn't mean there aren't times I don't understand or I'm confused or I'm frustrated, but I believe in God. Amen. And I would encourage you to consider that, not just to believe in him in an abstract sense, but to believe him to the, sense, to the point that you would submit your life to his authority. That's the difference. I believe in many things that I don't submit to. I believe I could be healthier if I ate less chocolate. <laughs> you can't have mine. <laughs> God knows the ending at the beginning. Proverbs 1 and verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There is no true knowledge without a reverence and a respect for God. You can earn a lot of degrees. You can have a lot of letters at the end of the name. You can accumulate great resources. You can be powerful and influential. You can have a tremendous following in the social media. But true knowledge begins with a respect and a reverence for God. Proverbs 22, 4 gives you just an example of this. It says, humility and the fear of the Lord bring. You ought to circle that little word if you've got a sheet in front of you. Humility and the fear of the Lord brings something to you. They will deliver more with, with greater dependency than Amazon. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. Well, I'm in. I'd like a little wealth and honor in life. So where does the line form? Well, it's under the banner of humility. 
in the fear of the Lord. Dorjash will bring food. Humility in the fear of the Lord will bring wealth and honor and life. God has told you the ending at the beginning. Well, you say, wait a minute, I humbled myself one day and I didn't get rich. <laughs> well, the New Testament counsel on that is remember the farmer. It says he sows his seed and then he waits patiently. Oh, well, how long do I have to wait? God didn't tell us. Well, I don't like to wait. I know, change. That's the point of the book. That's the point of the information. We will align our lives with a God perspective so we get God's engagement in our lives for a better outcome. Choose life. This really isn't that complicated. Now, if we add to that, God gives us some seasonal information. Times and seasons the Bible talks about in the earth so that we can be prepared for those unique seasons. It's springtime in Tennessee. That means if you have allergies, you need to get prepared. Because all the friends around you are going to think you've got COVID, and they won't come within 40 feet of you. In fact, you need a T-shirt that says, I look like this every spring. Just... There's a couple of passages that I think pretty accurately describe the season we're living in. One is from Isaiah. It's chapter 59, verse 12. Our offenses are many in your sight. And I'm not pointing our fingers beyond the church. I think the point of the whole pandemic and the shutdown and the disruptions is the church, the place where I live is in this nation. The church in this nation had taken our eyes off of the king. We had submitted our souls to comfort and convenience. And God in his mercy has been awakening us. Our offenses are many in your sight and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us. And we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion, and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. Now watch the outcome. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance, and truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. I can't think of a verse that's a more accurate description of contemporary American life. That justice is driven back, righteousness seems distant, truth has stumbled in the streets, and honesty is not even welcome. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, Jeremiah is the prophet in Jerusalem when God's judgment is about to fall upon them. There's an invading army headed their way, and God says there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Chapter 5 and verse 1, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. It's not an encouraging verse, but it's a hopeful verse. If I can find one person who will deal with honesty and seek the truth, God said, I'll intervene. You could determine to be that person. Stop being angry at who people aren't. Stop being angry at the ungodly, the wicked, the immoral, whoever it is you disagree with, and begin to say to the Lord, I will be such a person that it will bring a response from you that would bring deliverance to an exponential number. Decide to be that person. We can do that, church. So this notion of times and seasons, you're going to make goofy decisions if you're not aware of the times and seasons. Springtime in Tennessee is planting season. If you've been planting for the last 90 days, you're just flat out of luck because those seeds aren't going to do so well. But these next few weeks, it's time. Get your tomato plants ready. Get your garden stuff ready. Get your flowers ready. It's about to start growing around here. Right? For those of you that have to mow the grass, hallelujah. <laughs> it's growing season. Well, what season do you suppose we're in spiritually? See, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, yes, it does. You'd been in Israel in the first century when the Messiah was walking the hills of Galilee. It would have been in your best interest to have been aware of that. If you'd have been in Jerusalem when the Babylonians were headed that way, it would have served you well to know God's perspective. Times and seasons make a difference. So I'm going to take the balance of our time in this session and see if we can understand what's said about this time and season. Not to frighten us. Some of it's not particularly happy stuff. Because if, if we've been given the information, it's so that we can flourish in the midst of it. We don't have to look with fear at the future. 
Matthew 24 and verse 12, Jesus is speaking as a prophet. And he said, "Lawless, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Before the end of this age, before the gospel is preached to every nation in the world, Jesus said that lawlessness would increase. Some of the more modern translations will translate that word wickedness. Either way, it's uncomfortable. A dramatic increase in lawlessness and wickedness. And right along with that, Jesus talks about it. There's some other passages. I won't pull them all for you right now, but he said there'll be an increase in violence, that men and women will delight in wickedness. They'll give themselves to wickedness without apology, without shame. They won't hide it in the dark. They will bring it into the light and, and extend invitations to others. And out of that will come conflict in unprecedented ways in the earth. Wars and rumors of wars. The wars themselves won't be sufficient. There'll be other wars. It'll be a world filled with threat. And, and the real heart of it is the lawlessness. And Jesus gives us the way through. He says that we'll have to endure. He said it plainly. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, Pastor, I'd just rather not think about that. To understand that's as ill-advised as not choosing just not to think about the fact that it's winter. You better change your wardrobe or you won't stay healthy. All of us changed our lives because of a virus. You've changed something about your life, even if you're very belligerent. Certainly we don't fear a virus more than we fear God. Now then Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. But the characteristics is lawlessness. Is it safe to say that lawlessness is escalating? I don't think you have to have any discernment to do that. I mean, I don't watch much news these days. I don't find it overly helpful, but you can't avoid it. It feels like it, you know, it's like water. It finds the lowest point and leaks in. <laughs> Things pop up on your phone or show up on your computer screen or somebody tells you or I mean, we're witnessing an unprecedented deconstruction of our national borders. It's creating a humanitarian crisis, and it's not an accident. It's untold suffering for thousands of people. And those creating the issue deny it exists. Lawlessness being fomented. Completely ignoring the issue of illegal immigration versus legal immigration. In fact, they want to change the words. Let's not call it illegal. All right. So if I make a withdrawal from the bank where I don't have an account, <laughs> can we change the definition? Does it make it appropriate? I don't think so. We have a process for changing our laws and our procedures. If we want to change our immigration policy, there's a, plan, there's a, a, a pathway in place for that to be done. I've helped many people over many years immigrate to this nation. We're a nation of immigrants. It's a very positive part of our history. But that whole notion has just been swept aside for other agendas. And I won't list those. You can sort that out. But this kind of lawlessness is not new. We shouldn't be surprised. We've been watching this foment and gain momentum and grow for a long time. For more than a decade, we've had sanctuary cities. It's kind of chic. People celebrate it. They put it in their PR packets. Do you understand what it means? Major American cities that ignore federal law. They just say, we're not going to enforce the law in these cities. Lawlessness. Now, we'll take massive amounts of federal funds, but we're going to refuse to comply with the federal law. But we want our citizens to comply. It's been tolerated and rewarded. Lots of examples. We've been witnesses for months now of riots in our cities. Week after week, state and local officials refuse to intervene. We watch businesses, police precinct, precincts being destroyed by mobs while we shelter in place. Elected officials said to us, the National Guard should not be used in response to such angry mobs until it suited their purposes. 
And today, the National Guard surrounds our capital in Washington, D.C. It's disorienting, lawlessness at the highest levels of the land. We see it other places, lawlessness in the court of public opinion. The Sixth Amendment of our Constitution, and I'm not a legal scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I can read, promises the right to a trial of an impartial jury. But we are witnessing something at a level and a scope that we have not witnessed in a long, long time, the implementation of this court of public opinion as a tool of destruction. It's been unleashed. We laugh rather anxiously when Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss are attacked. And we may chuckle, but we look away from one another. Because we understand there's something inherently wrong with opposing Seuss while we promote violent video games and pornography. But we're... But for the most part, we're still silent because we're afraid we'll be targeted. And we understand it's a powerful thing. The governor of New York is currently under siege. I can't honestly say I've been a tremendous supporter. But I can say I'm not particularly comfortable with the public assault. If you remove the personality and step back and look at the process, it should cause all of us some distress. If the charges he faces were true, we would imagine a person of good character to resign his position. Yet we no longer expect our leaders to be persons of good character. So we take that issue off the table. As an alternative, we could say, well, let there be a full investigation. Let the legal process be followed. Except we're in the awkward place where we no longer trust the idea of a full and impartial investigation. So we're left with an angry mob. Lawlessness. And if, I think if we get really honest, most of us just prefer to look away. Because it's uncomfortable and it's unseemly. Let's watch a ball game. Maybe we can go to the beach. It's renewing. Lawlessness will continue to increase until we choose to submit ourselves to God's law. That's the resolution. We're not powerless. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in the first verse, discusses, presents to us the season before the Lord returns. It's very informative. It's as informative as a summary of spring in Tennessee. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, some report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't be easily alarmed around timing. There will be a lot of messaging that will be confusing. Amen to that. Well, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. If he's warning us against deception, you can know for certain that deception will escalate. For that day will not come until the rebellion. And a more literal translation would be the apostasy. The Greek word's apostasia. Until the, the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, the Antichrist. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. See, right now we see the spirit of Antichrist moving in the earth in unprecedented ways. There's less tolerance for the name and the person of Jesus than any time in recent memory. Jesus isn't welcome in the public square. He's not welcome in our public institutions. He's not welcomed in many of our corporate settings. You can be many things. You can behave in, in many immoral ways. In fact, you can celebrate it. Acknowledge it. Push it out there in the public square. And you'll not only be tolerated, you'll be honored. But if you declare advocacy for Jesus of Nazareth and submission to the authority of Scripture, it's a much less tolerant environment. Does that sound right? That expression of the spirit of Antichrist will continue to increase until ultimately it's embodied in an individual. The Antichrist can't assert authority in the world until we have yielded to the spirit of Antichrist so fully that we would tolerate that leadership. That's why your choices are so important. It's why we aren't just church attenders. 
It's why we don't just numbly gather in the building and endure the sermons, and then we can go live the life we want to lead. We are not powerless, folks. The spirit that brought Jesus out of the grave, we're going to talk about that more over these next few weeks, is alive and at work within us. But you can look, this individual's coming. He will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped. He'll set himself up as God. He will attract worship. Yes, I am the great problem solver. Verse 8, and then the lawlessness one will be revealed. He'll gain that position and authority without it being fully understood, his character, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Jesus isn't coming back on a picnic. He's coming back on a search and rescue mission. We will need his help. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. The only expressions of super, the supernatural don't come just from the Spirit of God. It's why you have to know the Holy Spirit so you can recognize an unholy one. Every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. I know that's where you're turning your page, but that line is very significant. Men and women will perish because of a choice they make. Remember that notion of choices we looked at just a second ago? Because they choose, they refuse to love the truth. You have to make a decision that you will love God's truth more than you love the approval of the culture. More than you, you have to love God's truth more than you love an opportunity for profit. You'll have to love God's truth more than you would love a moment of pleasure. You'll have to choose to love God's truth. Those ideas will put you in a minority. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they'll believe the lie and that all, who will, all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. There's an escalation in that. The choice is made not to love the truth. And once you make that decision, the next step downward is that you begin to delight in wickedness. I know we're in church and we'd all raise our hand at the right point. But if you want a, a place for a little personal reflection, ask the Spirit of God to help you sort through the things that cause you to bring delight to you. And if any of them are not God-honoring, begin to distance yourself from them. We want to give ourselves to the truth of God and delight in the things of the Lord. There was a time in my life, it's been a while, but there was a time in my life where I didn't particularly like Christians. They annoyed me. I could see all their holes and foibles and flaws and inconsistencies until finally it occurred to me that the reason I didn't like them and there was so little Jesus in me, I didn't like to be with people that had some in them. And if you're more comfortable with the wicked than you are the believers, there's a clue. I hate to admit it, my parents were right on this one. <laughs> my friends did say something about me without using any words. And then another characteristic of this season before the Lord comes back can be understood with two words. And in a sense, they're, they're not exactly opposites in meaning, but they represent two ends of a spectrum. One of the words is apostasy. We've already seen that, a falling away. And the other word is remnant. And they really go together. If there's a great falling away, there's some who won't fall away. They're the remnant. And both of these words are, are very much a part of the discussion as we approach the end of this age and the return of the king. There'll be a falling away. People who stand beneath the umbrella of faith, but will de deny components of it. They'll deny the necessity of the cross. Sin's not that big a deal. We can work through it. There's no uniqueness in Jesus. You'll hear a lot of that. The Bible isn't the authoritative word of God. The formal word for that is apostasy. It's a falling away from the truth. But there'll be those who don't fall away, a remnant, a group who hold to the truth. You'll have to decide your choice, which of those camps you choose to be in. Genesis 45, it's a different context, but I've told you many times that the book of Genesis introduces us to the big ideas of the Bible. By the time you finish Genesis, you understand the theme of the book. 
the whole book. And as Genesis comes to a conclusion, the central character is Joseph, and he's made his way to Egypt. It's been a very bumpy ride. He's suffered greatly, but he's in Egypt. Now he's risen to a position of some power, and his brothers, the ones who, tried, who sold him as a slave, show up. They need food. They're starving to death. And their brother they sold into slavery, they don't even recognize him, greets them in Egypt. It's Genesis 45 and verse 7, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. The church in the earth, remember that we read it in Matthew 24 a moment ago, if we will endure, we'll have the privilege of preaching the gospel in the whole world. There'll be a remnant of people. God, is, it says, is not anxious for judgment on the earth because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants everybody that's going to choose to have an opportunity. We have a privilege of holding out the light in a dark world. What an honor we have. Don't spend your time focusing on the darkness. Turn your attention to the light, what God is doing. Give your heart to it. Give your thoughts to it. Give your energy to it. Don't rage against the darkness. Turn up the light. If you work in a dark place, bring more Jesus. If, you're, if your kids are in a school that's pretty dark, turn up the light. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3 says, the time will come. Now Paul's writing, 2 Timothy is very near the end of Paul's life. In fact, he tells Timothy he's about finished. But he's talking about a point in the future. He said, the time will come. When men will not put up with sound doctrine, literally it says they won't tolerate it. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth, and they'll turn aside to myths. But then he gives Timothy some instruction, but he said, you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. It's going to bring hardship to you, Timothy, when this happens, but endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. Don't stop talking about Jesus. And discharge all the duties of your ministry. What should we do when the time comes when people won't tolerate sound doctrine? Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Don't whine. He told us it was coming. There was somebody that visited church last weekend. They live in northern Minnesota, 50 miles from the Canadian border. I said, how is it? And they said, cold. <laughs> well, if I went there, I'd be tempted to whine. Today's cold enough. But if you find yourself 50, minutes, 50 miles from the Canadian border and it's cold, don't whine. It goes with the territory. And we're not going to get to the point of the return of the king just having a parade and eating cake. Well, I don't like that. Duly noted. I'd like to visit Jerusalem. It's one of my favorite places in the world. But I would love to be able to click my heels together and get there. Because travel's not so fun. Flights get canceled. They seat you next to people that don't know Jesus. But the only way I know to get there is about an 11-hour flight from Newark or New York. That's a long time on a plane. It's a long time for me to sit still. But there's not another way to get there, so I don't complain. I look forward to being in Jerusalem. We're going to see the king, folks. Yeah. I'm running out of time. Second Timothy, first, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. So what's going to happen? There's going to be people stepping away. There'll be still, it'll be a form of religion. They'll sit in church buildings and they'll have Bibles and they'll wear robes and vestments and sing songs that you're familiar with, but they won't acknowledge the uniqueness of Jesus or the authority of Scripture. They won't embrace a biblical worldview. That's called apostasy. It's happening in, in unprecedented levels right now. And the result of that is a remnant. A group of people say, no, I'll stand for the truth. And it won't always be easy. But don't give up. Don't stop. And out of that will come a season of intolerance. It's a fourth characteristic. You know, tolerance, it's a good word. 
Historically, we have defined tolerance as respecting the opinions of those who differ from you. I have one opinion, you have another. We listen to one another. True tolerance leads to a fair exchange of ideas and oftentimes results in cooperation and maybe even respect. We can tolerate one another even if we have somewhat divergent opinions. Currently, tolerance is defined in another way. The current definition suggests that our, it's our responsibility to accept the ideas we're told to accept. And if you refuse to accept the ideas, you are loudly labeled as intolerant. Because I've told you what you're supposed to believe. Believe it or I'm going to say you're intolerant. Think as you're told to think. Do not think for yourself. In fact, the current notion is that if you attempt to think for yourself, you're reckless, you're a threat, you're intolerant. For instance, if you adopt a biblical worldview and believe God created us male and female, if you believe that, then gender confusion would not be something to address surgically or to celebrate or to encourage. Because the Bible clearly says that God's not the author of confusion. And there's something else at the root of that problem. In a very real way, our minds have become a battlefield. And the passive response to that is just to ignore what's happening. Hear no evil, see no evil. Christ followers have accepted to be a Christ follower, not just labeled one. If you choose to honor the Lord, it means we accept the objective truth of God's word. And that our worldview is shaped by the creator's perspective. It's not about what I think. I've chosen to submit my will to God's will. That's the nature of this journey. Jesus said, if you'd follow me, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, how does that play out? Not in raging against our culture. It acknowledges the battle within ourselves. Our mind is quite literally a battlefield. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. The imagery is a little lost on us, but to a first century audience, they were still familiar with the sacrificial system in Jerusalem. And there were sins that if you committed, the, the response to that would be to select, purchase an animal and bring it to the priest, and it would be offered on the altar. So uh, continually in the air above Jerusalem was the aroma of the sacrifices being offered on the altar. But before an animal was put on the altar, it was slaughtered. Its life was taken from it. Now Paul is using that imagery... But he says we should offer ourselves as living sacrifices. By the time that animal was placed on the altar, it, it no longer had any self-determination. There were no animals jumping off the altar. And when we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, we say, God, I'll serve you. I'll honor you in every context in my life, every aspect of my life. We've drifted away from that. It's why I think we needed an awakening that God's been helping us with. We're not finished yet. We're just beginning, I believe. I'm more hopeful for the church and the earth than I've ever been. To offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation means to change in potential. Don't conform, don't adapt to the prevailing standards of the world, but be changed in potential. How? By the changing how you think. We can't afford to let the messaging from a secular culture be what determines how we think. We'll have to read our Bibles. We'll have to know what it says. Don't take my word for it. I'm not the judge and the jury. I didn't write the book. I'm walking the journey with you. But spend enough time putting God's word in your heart that you have a God perspective on what's happening in our world. Ephesians 4 and verse 21 says, Surely you've heard of him and were taught in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with your former way of life to put off your old self. It's been corrupted. And to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. We're supposed to learn to think in new ways. We shouldn't think like the people that don't intend to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. We're not just different because of what's in the cup that we drink or in our wardrobe. We're different from the inside out, how we think, the values we hold, what we aspire to. I know my time's up.
Somebody has that ringtone on your phone and you did that on purpose. I forgive you. I really am about done. Healthy babies make noise, I promise. And if you download that ringtone, I'll find you. <laughs> One last component. It's important. Jesus gave us the information. We don't want to miss it. He gave us a threat warning. He said before we get to the end, the threats will increase. I don't like that. I wish it weren't true. If I had my preference, as you aged, your metabolism wouldn't slow down. Do you remember, remember your 16-year-old metabolism? Ah, oh, what a food furnace I was, right? A half a gallon of ice cream and a package of Oreos was a starter set. And you keep turning that calendar and your metabolism starts to laugh at you. You look at food and you get fluffy. That's just not right. But it's our reality, and we have to make some changes to go along with it. And Jesus gave us an honest evaluation of the season before he returns. We should pay attention. It's in Matthew 24, verse 9. He said, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith. There's a theme. We've heard that several times now. There's going to be apostasy, and there's going to be a remnant. They'll hate each other. Why will they hate each other? Because those who turn away will be angry at those who don't turn with them. We've been told. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Global intolerance for Christianity is going to escalate. Today, Christianity is the most persecuted religion on the planet. Persecution will increase. I'm not being negative. We've been given a road map. And there's going to be many who turn away because of the pressure. That's why we need one another. That's why isolation is so damaging. Because if we're left alone and we're isolated and we're left only to the information that comes to us, it's much, 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 much easier for us to be focused on the challenges of our own tiny world. When we get together, we realize that we're all walking through a difficult season. And we can extend a hand to one another. We can encourage one another. We can help one another. It's not for an attendance number, folks. In fact, when, when there's no people in the building, it's a very peaceful place. <laughs> not a very effective place, but a peaceful place. And the betrayals will cause hatred. There'll be false prophets. And all of these pressures have one intended objective. They're to keep us from preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the whole world. But God said it will be preached. So there'll be a remnant. There'll be a group of people who say, we won't stop. We will complete the course. We will stand up. We will yield to the truth. What a wonderful message. Luke 6, it's the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are you when men hate you. Excuse me? I thought I was blessed when I got an award. I thought I was blessed when I got a raise. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. How much time do you spend thinking about rewards in heaven? I hope you spend more time thinking about rewards in heaven than any rewards you're pursuing under the sun. Heaven's going to last longer for that's how they treated the, their fathers treated the prophets. But then he gives us some woes, and I'll finish with this. Woe to you who are rich. You've already received your comfort. And woe to you who are well fed, for you'll go hungry. And woe to you who laugh, for you'll mourn and weep. And woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that's how their fathers treated the prophets. I grew up around horses, so woe is a word I know. But woe to a horse is W-H-O-A. It means stop. The word Jesus is using is W-O-E. It means you'll wish you'd stopped. I grew up in a barn. I'm not complex. When he says, woe to you who are rich, he's not condemning wealth. He's the one who gives us the ability to get wealth. When he says, woe to you who are well fed, he's not condemning good food. He told us to pray for our daily bread. When he says, woe to you who laugh, 
He's not discouraging laughter because the Bible says a merry heart does good like a medicine. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. He's not suggesting you be such a rogue that there's not a good word to be found about you. He's talking about the objective of our lives. Let's go back to our choices. I set before you life and death. Now choose life. What are you giving yourself to? Have you given yourself to wealth? Have you given yourself to gluttony? The Bible condemns gluttony far more frequently than it does drunkenness. We just don't talk about it because we have a little problem. (laughs) Don't give yourself to laughter and distractions. Don't give yourself to being an influencer with people that you don't even know. Offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Folks, we're living in a most amazing time. There's more on the topic. We'll pick it up in another session. I don't want you to be discouraged. If you didn't hear last night, you need to go back and hear it because it's the joy that underscores, undergirds all of this. The greatest honor of our lives is serving the King. We will see Him one day. I'm going to ask you to close with me by making a proclamation about Easter. Would you like to do that? Thank you for saying yes because it's the only exit I've got. (laughs) If, if, If you'll stand with me, they're going to put it on the screens. It's not on your outline. Felt like we missed an Easter together. It doesn't feel like it. We did miss an Easter together. So I, I, I want to I proclaim Easter as loudly and as broadly as God gives us the ability to do. Can we make this declaration? It comes right out of the Scripture. Let's say it together. Easter reminds us that life is greater than death, that faith triumphed over fear, and suffering must give way to rewards and restoration. This Easter is a declaration that Jesus is Lord in our world. Jesus is Lord over every pandemic. Jesus is Lord over every government and government official. Jesus is Lord over the media and big tech and all those who imagine they can control information. Jesus is Lord in our homes. Jesus is Lord over our future. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Jesus is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. He's made us to be a kingdom of priests and to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.